Welcome back to another episode of the Suits in the Stadium podcast. I am your host, Casey Coleman. Joining me on this week's episode is Nathan Wood. Nathan is currently an associate AD at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Really enjoyed my conversation with Nathan. I think the biggest thing that stuck out was when he talked about the idea of customer service and not necessarily customer service to people that are attending your event or attending your game, but customer service to your fellow employees that work around you, whether that's the big boss at the top, whether that's your supervisor, whether that's someone that may be below you, an intern or something like that, really just being that person that's about customer service, that's about being someone that's dependable, that's reliable, that they know that if something comes that they need help with, that they know that they can reach out to that person. So really great point by Nate. Really enjoyed my conversation. Hope you enjoy my conversation with Nathan Wood. Folks, please help me welcome in this week's guest, Nate Wood. Nate has previously made stops working at Jacksonville University, USC, University of Michigan, and is now an associate AD at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Nate, how are you today? Doing great. Thanks. Love it. Love it. Nate, we connected on LinkedIn, uh, kind of through me having Tim Tessalone on the podcast, said you'd be interested in being on the podcast and super excited to hear about your journey in sports. Yeah, no, thanks for having uh, having me on. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll, we'll jump right in. Uh, what pivotal experiences in your education or early career helped you to realize the sports industry was the right path for you? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, undergrad, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I knew I was going to go to law school. I wasn't sure where I was going to go with a law degree. Um, was pretty sure I didn't want to be in a courtroom um, arguing, uh, certainly not in criminal court or anything like that. Um, you know, my education background, you know, I come from a real low income family, grew up in the Midwest, um, first generation college student. So when I thought about going to law school, it was more about getting my family out that, you know, generational circle yeah. of poverty kind of thing. So that was where my head was at the time. Um, and then once I got through college, I, you know, I had, you know, a piece of advice given to me, which is funny now that I look back on it, but something that I think a lot of people say, but they don't really think about, right. Which is, um, you know, you, you if you do something you love, you never work a day in your life, right? Right. That, that's a common phrase. And someone had said that to me young and I was like, okay, well, what do I love? Right. What is it? What am I passionate about? What could I wake up every morning and be excited about going to work and not push the snooze button and want to sure. go to work? And the idea that popped in my head was Wrigley Field and okay. um, wanting to every morning wake up and if my office overlooked Wrigley Field <laughs> and, and that skyline, I'd be happy. That would be a great day. So I right. thought about those like sports. Clearly, that's what I love. That's what I'm passionate about. That would be great to, to get into that industry. So um, so when I was looking for law schools, I looked for one that had a sports law program. I wasn't an athlete myself. I have you know, no background in sports. So I knew that that was going to be a disadvantage. It was going to be tough to get, you know, break in. Um, but I, I looked at a, a school that had a sports law program. Florida Coastal at the time had a, a sports law program. Um, law school is tough to get into. Um, and so I, I took, you know, took the shot at Florida Coastal. They, they let me in, um, thankfully. And so I got my law degree there. I had a great experience in law school. It was amazing. It was exactly what I wanted it to be. Um, the sports law experience was great. They had a great program there. And there was a, a professor there by the name of Richard Karcher, who's now a, a faculty athletic rep at Eastern Michigan. But at the time, he was a law school professor at, at Florida Coastal and um, kind of guided me a little bit. Um, cause at the time I still didn't know kind of where in sports I was going to be. And, um, a lot of lawyers were agents and that what really wasn't appealing uh, either. Um, you know, I would love college sports, but I would, you know, again, I never played college sports, didn't, wasn't a manager, didn't, you know, do any of that kind of stuff. Um, so when I talked to this professor Karcher, um, you know, he had mentioned, Hey, there's this you know, niche kind of industry for lawyers, it's compliance, you know, in athletic departments, um, you know, they really need people with, you know, that kind of background. I said, oh, okay, that sounds great. And so got an internship. Part of the law school program was you did externships and internships with sure. um, sports programs. So they had a relationship with the PGA, which is there in Jacksonville, Florida, um, Jacksonville Jaguars, a couple other institutions, but I had one with, and it was great. Loved it. Um, really loved it and really realized like, oh, wow, I can do this. This is something that 
even though, you know, I didn't have a background in sports because of the, you know, law background and, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, this could be something I could do. And, um, so that was great. I mean, that was where I really, you know, first realized, Hey, this, this could happen. This could be a thing, you know, um, I could make this happen. And so that, that's really how it got started. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Sticking on kind of that educational piece uh, in the ever-evolving world of sport management, how do you stay updated and continue to learn beyond formal education? Are there ongoing educational resources? Are there on? Excuse me. Are there any ongoing educational experiences or resources you recommend? Yeah, I think um, you know one of the things that's pretty commonplace now. And- for an everyday thing, because our our industry, as you know, is moving every day, right? It used to be uh, these cycles of legislative, you know, um, uh, uh, proposals that would go up and our industry would change. And maybe there was a lawsuit or two that maybe would shift. But now it seems every day, every week, there's a new shift. So um, there's no more. Let's read this tome from 2012 and try to get some insight (laughs) because that's garbage now, right? That's total garbage. So you can't. So that's where I think it is, um, you know, it, it's imperative that you stay up to date. One of the things in our industry now is D1 ticker, right? Um, B1 ticker is an amazing tool to use because you get it just a, a, a slice of college athletics every day, a little bit of sure. it. You can deep dive into the areas of interest and the things in your area that are great. Um, and so that, you know, that, that is helpful for us. I think the other thing is lead one. So lead one's a association, um, uh, Macmillan runs and, and they put out a lot of stuff, really important stuff from an AD perspective. So I think that's really important to stay up. They, they do a lot of um, studies and polls and information gathering and stuff like that, which is great to stay up on um, a lot of the court cases that are going on, a lot of the national trends that are going on. Um, and then as far as a professional organization, I think no matter what area you're in, whether it's, you know, um, sports information or compliance or, you know, marketing, um, you know, certainly sign up and be a member of your um, professional organizations, whether that's NAC or NACTA or whatever it is. Um, I think those opportunities are great from a networking perspective, going to those meetings. Um, I'm on an education um, committee myself on, on NAC, um, which helps me network, uh, helps me grow that network, kind of for, for, you know, using lingo of our time, it builds my brand, right, with other colleagues out there. So it yeah. shows that, hey, look, we're doing this. So, um, you know, this is where my direction is. This is kind of my expertise and kind of putting that out there. So uh, those are the, 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 that's what I would recommend. Yeah, I love it for sure. Uh, it, it sounds like, as you mentioned, kind of talking about your, your early years, you didn't come from from a sports background, I personally didn't come from a sports background either, uh, which is why I included this next question in our conversation. Uh, what advice would you give individuals who are considering a career in sport management but may not have a traditional sports-related educational or work experience background? How can they leverage their existing skills and knowledge to break into the industry? Yeah, so what I would say is that every athletic department has every facet of the private sector as part of its uh, organization. So you have a business office, right? You have accountants and you have um, individuals who are, you know, buried in spreadsheets all day. So maybe you had a accounting background or a business management background. Well, there's, there's places for you. Maybe you have a marketing background. Every athletic department has a marketing um, department. Uh, Maybe you have the fundraising, right? Background. Well, we, every school has a fundraising arm. Or maybe you have a legal arm and you get into compliance. Uh, maybe you don't have any of that, and this is no knock on the ticket office, okay? <laughs> maybe you don't have any of that, but you still want to work in athletics. A ticket office job is, if you look around the country, there are two entry-level jobs that a lot of people will get. And one of yeah. them is event management, right? So game day stuff, right? Where you do, you know, your ticket, you know, you're at a gate somewhere or something like that. And then tickets. Um, now, those are the you know most fancy positions right they don't pay very well but (laughs) but you can just be a good worker with no experience and get those jobs and that gets your foot in the door and and, you know my first boss um donna kirk she was the swa at jacksonville she's now the swa at north florida she started in the ticket office you know as a 24 year old 
first job out of college, out of grad school, she started the ticket office and now she's a senior woman administrator at a division one school. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and you grow that that's how athletic departments work. You kind of grow with the job and where you're needed. Um, so you will accumulate those skills once you're in the athletic department, but use what you have, find, you know, that little department that, that works for you um, and go for it. Uh, but, but I think that that's helpful to know that, you know, all of the skills in the private sector, those are skills that we need. I mean, you know, whether it's, again, finance, legal backgrounds, accounting, um, customer service. Um, yeah. And that's one of the things now, especially with it's a different topic for a different day, but the amount of, of media and the amount of um, options that people have as far as entertainment. Sure. Um, sure. One of the things that we are focusing on, and I think the industry as a whole is focusing on, is customer service. And how do we make sure that the experience of coming to a game, coming to an athletic event, is better than sitting at home and watching it on TV? Because that experience yeah. is getting much better, and it's getting sure. much easier. And so you have to, really, you know, so so do you have, you know, are you in that space, right? Are you in that space where you're innovating and you're doing these new things? And that is something athletic departments are looking for too, technology, right? I mean, we... I mean, if you're in the technology space, we're hiring technology people all the time, whether it's putting up cameras in the backstop for, um, you know, softball for replay, right? Or networking, uh, you know, our coaches offices to here so that we can, you know, communicate across lines or the media building and trying to, you know, pump out an ACC network programming through the university, like all of that stuff. So there is yeah. a, there is, I mean, HVAC. We, we hire HVAC people, right? We have the Smith Center, right? We post posted a job six months ago for an HVAC guy. And their only job is to make sure that the heating and cooling in the Smith Center runs perfect. And so, like, you would have no experience in sports and don't need any, but you get to run the Smith Center. Like, that's kind yeah. of cool, right? <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so that's what I would say is there are, um, you know, a, a number of jobs in athletics that your skills could be perfect for. Yeah, you hit it on the head. Lots of options and, and opportunities. Uh, you've worked approximately 13 years so far in the sport management field. To what or to whom do you credit your longevity in the sports world? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, probably not the best answer, but I would say one of the things that I realized, again, back to my you know statement about where I came from, um, and trying to break that cycle of poverty yeah. and everything else for my family and, and yeah. my kids. Um, I think, so I grew up in Elkhart County. This the, the Elkhart County is the number one producer of mo uh, motor homes, right? So, so RVs. Okay. It's terrible. All of my family works there. Cousins, aunts, uncles, everybody has worked there their whole lives. And it's hard work. It's really hard work. I mean, you, you know, people look, you know, 50 when they're 30, because it's just, it's really hard work. Sure. I had the opportunity to work there a couple summers um, in between college, you know, um, and it was awful. It was awful, right? It was an <laughs> awful experience. You had, yeah. uh, and, and look, people do this every day. So I'm not saying that, you know, I don't want to put this down, this life down. Yeah. My family does this every day. Yeah. But, you know, you have a, a horn that goes off when you start work. There's a horn that goes off when you can eat your sandwich. There's a horn that goes off when you start work again. And there's a horn that goes off when you go home. That was not the life that I wanted to live. And I knew that early on. And so I would say my motivation to stay in sports is that. Okay. Is not to hear a horn and not to hear a horn when I have to go home and not to hear a horn when I have to eat um, or what I want to eat. And so that that is my motivation. Um, my motivation now that I have kids is um for my kids is sure. i know that this this industry this job will provide an amazing opportunity for me but also my kids so yeah. not just financially right which i'm not there yet financially right i'm mid-level just like everybody else at some point hopefully i'll get there yeah um, but but the opportunity to come to games right to experience firsthand stuff that I would have only dreamed of as a kid, right? Being able yeah. to go down to Smith Center and shoot hoops on a court, right? I mean, go down to Carmichael and be like, hey, Michael Jordan shot a, put a shot right here. Go ahead and shoot one, right? That's an yeah. amazing thing. So, so that's what I, that's what keeps me in sports now is, is the ability to, um, so that maybe that's where I started was maybe the fear factor, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. of, of making sure that I got out of that. But now it's the hope. 
right? It's hope for my kids and hope that for their better future and, and, and for all of us. So I think that's what kind of keeps me going um, right now. Yeah, I think that's great. You know, like you mentioned, it initially started with the fear for you and now it's switched to, to wanting to provide those opportunities that, that you as a kid didn't get to have and now that your kids get to have. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, transition to the advice portion of our conversation. Uh, what are the key skills or qualities that you believe aspiring sport management professionals should focus on developing, especially to try to stand out in such a crowded uh, job market? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I mentioned it a, uh, earlier, but customer service. And yeah. so what I, and what I mean by that is not just customer service for the actual customer, right? But customer service for your supervisor, customer service to your colleague, customer service to the intern below you. Being somebody who can be of service at all times to everybody, invaluable, invaluable. I, in athletics, just like I, you know, the, the, what I mentioned earlier, Donna Kirk, you know, she started out in the ticket office and now she's an SWA. you got to be able to be a jack of all trades. And so yeah. being of service and being available um, and, and having the, I, you know, having the notion that, Hey, I can go call on this person because I know they're going to be ready. Right. They're, they're always, you know, ready for the next thing. Yeah. Um, you know, they're always looking for, you know, whatever that next project is. Uh, they're willing to help. They're asking good questions. They're offering up their time. Um, I think that is a huge deal of making sure that they're satisfied, right? You come back afterwards, say, Hey, I did this project. what did you think? You know, was it good? Yeah. Was it bad? Was it timely? Maybe it could have been done better. Maybe it should have been done this way. What did you think about it? Yeah. Uh, all of those customer service, the things you would think about doing um, in a customer service role, do that in everything you do and, and you will be a better employee. Um, that would be my advice. Yeah. Love it. Great insight there for customer service. Uh, the sports industry is known for its high pressure moments. How do you maintain composure and make strategic decisions during intense situations? Yeah. Um, been a part of a couple of those. And, and I think one of the things I've pulled from all of those is you, especially in my role in compliance and in coming in and having to like lay down the law essentially um, is you have to be the cooler in the room, meaning you have to have a dead pulse, right? Ice cold veins um, because coaches are not right. Coaches are loud. Coaches are emotional. Um, a lot of times they're not rational, right? They're, they're completely irrational. I saw this video of uh Trent Dilfer on the sidelines going crazy. Yeah, I saw it too. <laughs> um, and you would see, if you saw that in a regular like you would be like, "Oh my god, this man should be arrested," right? But in sports yeah. it's just yeah, that's normal. He's just upset about some, you know, one small thing. Yeah. Um but that's an everyday occurrence, right? I mean, if you're in a coach's offices and they're upset about some, you know, some other school that did this thing that they think is cheating, they're going to let you have it. Right. And so, to you know, you got to be the cooler in the room. But you also have to stand that a lot of times the anger and the animosity is not directed towards you. You, you can't take it personal. And I think that is what's been helpful for me um, in being the cooler is saying, look, this isn't personal. It's not me. I'm not the NCAA. I didn't write that rule. Right. Yeah. I'm not I'm not the one out there cheating. <laughs> right. Um, and so understanding that. Right. And, and, and being being confident enough to know that when Mac or Hubert or Roy Williams or Lane Kiffin or whoever it is, is yelling at you red in the face, mad as hell. <laughs> it's not you. Right. Yeah. And so you almost have to just let it pass through you, right? Like a wave. And so, um, but that is intense. I think the, the other thing that is hard and it takes just a lot of time and experience is to grasp the bigness of some of the decisions. So, um, Another headline example of Kansas basketball player, right? Kicked off the team for sexual assault, but he was convicted at the previous school. So this is a very similar to the Boise State Baylor situation, right? Where a former student, they took him on. They knew about the allegation and they took him on. And so understanding, and that's a big decision, right? To decide, yeah. okay, we're going to bring in this player. That yeah. was more than a Bill Self decision, I would think, right? That that if we're going to bring in this player, that there was somebody else that signed off. And so sure. knowing what the risk is and understanding the bigness of, okay, look, we can decide to take this player and he might score us 10 points. So what is the worst case outcome that can happen? And are you prepared right. for that? And so understanding right. kind of that bigness of a very small decision of just getting a transfer player in to play basketball 
and how that could have repercussions, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think understanding that bigness and that you are just a small part of that helps because um, if you think that what you did or what you do is going to affect the outcome, it, that's scary. But when you know that is a huge issue and there are multiple layers and there's going to be at least 10 different decision makers that are going to have input on this, it makes it easier to make those decisions because you know you're not on an island. Yeah. Um, even when you're an AD, right, or a president, you're not making those decisions on an island. You you have all of these people and, you know, years of experience, you know, all of this. And so you're going to make those decisions as a group and that makes it easier. You're not going to be an island. Now, if you're a football coach, you're a little bit of an island. You're going to make those decisions. <laughs> you're going to own those decisions. Those are going to be yours for the most part. Yeah. Um, the administration, um, you make them as a group. So that makes it, you know, um, digestible. Yeah. Yeah. Bigger picture. Uh, next question. I know you mentioned uh, a woman during your time at Jacksonville state, uh, but just kind of curious, maybe different mentors you had in your journey and how they best helped you along the way. Yeah, no, Donna was great. Um, I mean, she was a great mentor early on. Um, she got me, you know, the opportunity to go to USC. So she, um, and you know, I know this is a huge thing about networking, but I'll just tell you this, you know, that was, um, that is how this all works, right? We, um, we're a very small group in athletics. If you want to work at the, uh, power five, we're calling it that now still, <laughs> right. That that's about 65 schools. Yeah. So that's 65 bosses, 65. That's it. 65 yeah. bosses. There's no other industry in the world that only has 65 bosses, right. Unless it's like a, the oil industry or something. Right. <laughs> um, so you got six, they all know each other. They all go to the same meetings. They're all on the same conference calls. Um, and so you have to be able to impress the people that you're working with so that they can, you know, talk about you to other people um, and network and, and other people are willing to call um, and ask questions. And that's how that happened. So Donna got a call from somebody at USC uh, and they said, hey, we're looking for somebody to you know, fill this position. Do you have anybody, anybody in mind? She said, yeah, I have this great guy. He just fell into my lap, but he's better. You know, he'd probably be better suited for there um, and call him. And so that, that was an amazing opportunity. Right. But it was only because um, I had built that relationship with Donna and really impressed her enough um, uh, for her to be able to recommend um, me going on. Uh, so she was a great influence and really helped me start that big jump in my career. Um, and then, you know, since then, I've really relied on an uh, individual I mentioned earlier, Rick Karcher, uh, Professor Rick Karcher. So he was uh, my sports law professor in law school. He's now a um, sport management program at uh, EMU in, in Eastern Michigan. Um, but I've leaned on him a lot. Um, what's great about him is um, he is a player advocate. So 100 percent, he believes in unions, that players should get paid. Um, that, you know, that they are, um, should look just like the professional uh, leagues um, and that, you know, the NCAA and the schools are taking advantage of them. I don't necessarily disagree with any of that, right? Like from a philosophical standpoint or even from a legal standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. We could we could make those. But he sees me working here as totally antithetical to his complete being, right? So he, you know, we'll go on this back and forth and I'll try to justify what we're doing and he'll tear it down. Um, and so some people would look at that and be like, how is this guy a mentor? All he's doing is, you know, tearing down your industry, everything you do. And it is amazing. I will tell you that he's a great friend of mine. And and I think everybody should find somebody in their life um, that doesn't agree with you. Um, because I think a lot of times we try to surround ourselves with yes people. I know, you know, a lot of people do. And that doesn't do you any good. Sure. Um, I want somebody to disagree with me because I want to justify what I'm doing. So he makes me justify what we're doing. Right. And so I. I have to think about it and I have to really logically rationally think about what we're doing and justify it back to him because he's not going to stand for it. Um, and so having somebody else to question your motives, question what you're doing, I think is great. And I, so, so for him to be my mentor has been amazing. And I think um, for people out there, you know, getting in the industry, finding somebody, um, whether that's a colleague, an old professor that maybe you disagreed with, right. Maybe philosophically you disagree with them, keep them in your lives. Keep them because you want to be challenged, right? You don't want to sit and be like, yep, this is my idea. I'm good with it. I don't have to, you know, um, I don't have to have conviction about it because I've, I've already made up my mind. 
no, nope, every day. This is why I'm doing it, right? Um, and that's helpful. That's really helpful. Yeah, I think that I think that's great insight for sure. Just the idea of a of a yes man versus someone that's going to challenge you. Uh, obviously, we like people that agree with our ideas and support our ideas, but uh, it's also good to have those people that don't, and it, it helps us to refine ourselves for sure. Uh, but it's kind of sticking. You you kind of opened your response there with the idea of networking. Uh, obviously, networking is very important in sports. I've learned, you know, even in my my year so far in the sport management uh, field and in my master's program, just how important it is. Uh, the question is, how can individuals new to the field effectively build a strong network in the sport management sector? Yeah. Um, so I would say be as friendly as you can to everybody. And, and this is why you don't know in your class right now, you are sitting next to somebody who's going to be an AD someday. Sure. You're, gonna, you're sitting next to somebody who could be the pre next president of the NCAA. Sure. You're be sitting next to somebody who is in a position of hiring somebody. And so you never know who that's going to be. And it could be, again, the guy in the ticket office who has <laughs> no aspirations to be an AD, but somehow backed his way into being an AD and now has yeah. the opportunity to hire you in yeah. a senior leadership role. So make friends with everybody in the athletic department. Uh, be as friendly as you can. Um, burn no bridges, all of that stuff. Really learn from the experience. I think Tesla said this um, on there too. You know, go that extra hour, right? Yep. And, and yep. whether it's fifteen minutes or an hour, you know, that's up to you. But <laughs> um, but stay that extra fifteen minutes. Get to know them. Ask them how their family's doing. You know, ask them, hey, how did you get in the industry? Yeah. Make that special connection um, because that next person, you know, they might get a job at your dream school, and all of a sudden. Maybe they're not in the position of hiring, but they heard wind of a job opening before it gets opened. Yeah, they call you because you know you're interested. They they know that's your dream job, but all of a sudden you have an inside track to that job. So again, network networking is just exactly what it sounds like: building that network. Yeah. And it's everybody, and I think a lot of times we get you know caught up in like, oh, I got to have Bubba. That's got to be in my network, right? Bubba's got to be in my network, right? <laughs> Dean Smith has got to be in my network. He's the yeah. one that's no, 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 no. Right. Paya, the assistant AD at Ohio State. She's yeah. going to be the one that's going to get you that next job. Right. Yeah. Um, it's going to be Christina Miner at Northwestern, the associate AD for compliance. She's going to know that a marketing job is opening up um, and she's going to give you the inside track. So it, those are the kind of things that um, in networking you really have to do and just put out all those feelers because you never know where it's going to come from. You really don't. And so. Yeah. Um, the best thing you can do is be friendly and connect with every single individual in the athletic department. Um, Cause yeah. you never know where that next opportunity is going to come from. Yeah. Yeah. I had a previous guest uh, in season one, talk about the idea of horizontal networking, right? Like yes. you just mentioned, it's different people in your position, but at a different school, as you mentioned at Ohio state or a Northwestern or whatever. Yes. Those up and down networking to the, to the top dog are obviously important, but having those people that are, you know, on the same level or yes. a part of your team or a part of your even ex same athletic department, like you mentioned, uh, is just as vital as well. Yeah. So just a, a pl I'll give a quick plug to the ACC. Yeah. Here. So the ACC started about a year and a half ago, um, this program called Frontline Administrators. And what they do is about every, about twice a month, every other week, they have, you know, administrators with one to five years of experience and they get on a call and they talk about a topic that networking they talk about a topic about you know whatever it is and they all talk about it and we encourage all of our staff to be on there love uh, it because to your point it is horizontal networking right somebody yeah. on that call is going to go get a job back home and you want to move back home now yeah they're there and so you can call them up and say hey remember me from this call so yeah. there's all those little things like that where if you really listen put your ear to the ground and these little you know these it's a twice a month one hour zoom Right. Yeah. You see faces, you see names, they see yeah. you, you ask a question. All of a sudden, I know that guy in North Carolina. Right. Oh, yeah. I remember that guy in North Carolina. Oh, I remember his face. Oh, yeah. They're applying now. Oh, yeah. That name right there. So it all works. It's all connected. And like I said, we're especially in sports. We're such a small world yeah. um, in college athletics that you, you, you know, you're going to know those people or somebody. Sure. You know, you're going to be one person removed from knowing that person. Sure. Sure. Uh, moving, moving on. Uh, Sports is not a nine to five Monday through Friday, obviously weekends, late nights. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, you, you have kids of your own now. Uh, just curious, 
What is the key to maintaining a good work-life balance? How do you not get overwhelmed with your career and still make time for family and friends and things you enjoy doing outside of work? Yeah, um, it's tough. I mean, one of the things I think people have to understand, and I would say this is probably true for all sports industries, whether it's professional or collegiate or whatever, is it is not nine to five. And and you are just the, the nature of the sport, whether you want to or not, you are going to work outside of those hours. That's just the way it works. Sure. Um, I think the way you do it is one, and this is not going to, this is not going to be easy, but you got to find a good boss. Yeah. Because you got to find somebody who is willing to be flexible. Um, somebody who understands what families means, yep. somebody who has a family um, and understands that. Um, and not everybody's, not every employer is going to be that, right? Not every employer is going to be that. And, and, but that's my advice is find somebody who finds that flexibility is important, especially when you have kids, cause you're going to need it. Um, but you have to have that because if you are a rigid, a rigid nine to five and you are, um, you know, you got kids like I do and my wife's got to go do something and I got to come home to watch the twins. Um, what, what am I going to do? You know, there's just nothing, there's no way to do it. And, and give you a great example. A lot of times we're like, oh, I got family or I'll have this. We're, my wife's from Michigan. I'm from Indiana. We live in North Carolina right now. We don't have any family here. Yeah. So it's just us, right? Yeah. And so like, I wouldn't have taken this job if I didn't think that my that Bubba and Mariel would have not given me the flexibility I needed to be able to do my family too. Because if I was, you know, I, I wouldn't have moved this far from home without that. Yeah. I think a lot of people, sometimes they move to that dream job, right? Like uh, LSU called, Oh my God, LSU, the Tigers, this is awesome. Right. But yeah, it's sure. a thousand miles away from home. That's going to yeah. be tough if you're going to have a family. So yeah, it's a great job, but if you're spending all of your free time commuting and doing all these other things, it doesn't work. Um, so I think that's important. I think two, another thing you can't control, especially now because of housing prices, live as close as you can to work. Uh, don't try, you know, try to cut out the commute as much as possible. When I was at yeah. Michigan, I had a, like an hour one way commute. Um, it was awful. It was terrible. <laughs> and, and the worst thing about it was like I game days. I would be done. It'd be halftime. We'd be winning the game. All my duties would be done. And I just want to go home. And so I'd have a whole hour. The game would be over by the time I get home because I'd listen to it on the radio. And yeah. so, but I couldn't stay and enjoy it, which is the yeah. whole point of being in athletics, right? Is being able to enjoy the games and, and stick around for it. And so I didn't yeah. get an opportunity to enjoy it. And that was really tough. And so try as much as you can to work close because you're going to be here a lot and you're going to need to be here. And again, it's not a, you need to be here from nine to five in your chair. It's you need to come in at seven o'clock because a student athlete needs to meet with you in private. And that's the only time they have because they have class and they have practice otherwise. So yeah. that's the kind of flexibility you need to be right. You don't need to be here from yeah. seven to seven. You just need to be able to get here by seven to have this meeting. So yeah. being close is helpful. Um, I think the other thing that's really important is knowing when to turn it off. I think a lot of people say that, um, but you got to be able to turn it off and go on vacation and know that that's going to, you know, and everybody has their own way of doing that, but you have to take vacation. You're going to get burnout. Um, you don't see a lot of gray haired compliance folks and go look at the head compliance folks at any 65, any of the 65 power five, not too many gray hairs in there. Um, and there's a reason for that because there's a lot of burnout. You have to, it just, it's a really stressful job. It is. Sure. Um, and so you, you, you gotta have time. You gotta, you gotta uh, step out. Um, and that means turning off your phone. And if that means calling coaches and I've done this too, I've called coaches said, Hey coach, look, I'm taking a vacation. I'm going to the beach. I'm going to be gone for five days. If you need anything, call this coach. And sometimes you have to proactively do that because sure. they'll just call you. They're going to ignore the out of office <laughs> message, right? They don't care. Right. They'll find they don't a way. It because they're just going to call you. You yeah. can't put it in the office on your, on your phone. Um, and so co proactively calling them, I think helps. Um, and coaches will respect that because they understand the burnout. They understand that, Hey, when I'm checked out, I'm checked out. And so if you give them that heads up, I think that's really helpful. Um, and that can help the stress too, because one of the things I think early on when I took vacations and I didn't tell coaches that, and I'd see a head coach call, you got to take it. Yeah. <laughs> take it. Right. I mean, if that coach or that phone rings, they don't know you're on vacation. Right. So they just think you're bad at your job. 
That's what they're <laughs> going to think because yeah. you, you've you always answered your phone. So why aren't you answering your phone? You must be bad at your job. And so they yeah. don't, that's why it's helpful to call ahead and do that again. I talk, this is not a normal industry, right? I mean, for those people out there that are scared, this is not normal. This is yeah. not what you think, you know, working life is. It is a life a little bit. It is. Yeah. And, and that's the last point I'll make. For those of you who are looking for life partners, your life partner has to be on board with this. I think that is so important. Um, so many coaches, right? You see coaches all the time with divorce and that kind of thing, but even sport administrators. I mean, I've moved, you've talked about, I've moved three times cross country. Yeah. Um, and so your significant other has to be on board with those moves, where to go, um, what opportunities you're okay with and you're not. My wife and I made a list and we said, okay, here's the States. No way. Okay. Doesn't matter how much they're offering. We're not <laughs> going, we're not going to Idaho. Like, well, Probably a great state, fine. Not going to move there, right? Just not going to happen. Um, and so you you got to sit down and have that conversation because it's a real one. I've seen people that have taken great jobs and had to move back because the wife wasn't happy or the husband wasn't happy, right? Okay. Or whatever. The kids weren't happy. That's yeah. another thing, right? You took the kids out of high school to take a better job and it's better for your career, but family-wise, it's not. So you have to have a family and you have to have a significant other that's okay with that. Um, you got to be okay with being away from family as well. Um, and, and so that's part of the work-life balance. Like if you're not okay with that on the front end, you're never going to get okay with it. And so you yeah. have to be okay with knowing that there's going to be moments you're going to miss. I had um, uh, John Sanderson, strength con conditioning coach at Michigan for Michigan basketball. Been there many years. Um, said something to me once and, and I just, I've never forgotten it, which is he has never taking his kids trick-or-treating ever because he's a basketball he's basketball october 31st that's basketball season yeah. you're either practicing you're on the road you're doing everything and so like as an individual if you want to be in the basketball world you have to be okay with probably never going trick-or-treating with your kids because you're going to be practicing on the road traveling doing something um and you're just gonna have to you're never gonna correct that you're just yeah. gonna have to be okay with it um and that's tough. Again, some people will be like, nope, not for me. I want to, my kids are more important. I want to be there. Um, but that's just something that you, you have to make peace with before you get into it because it'll never correct itself. Yeah. I want to quickly go back and touch on something you, you mentioned. Uh, cause I had a previous guest talk about it as well, just about in the decision-making, mm -hmm. uh, when you're making that move, uh, the guest mentioned it. you mentioned it. It's not Nate making the decision. It's not Nate is accepting a job at University Sorry. of North Carolina. It's Nate and his family are choosing to go to North Carolina, as you mentioned, based on different things. You mentioned you and your wife made a list. Here's where we're willing to go. Here's where we're not willing to go. And it's just, it's a family decision. It's not the individual. It's not the one person you're deciding as a family. You have a family. You have a wife. You have children. They've got to, you know, find friends and go to school and get involved in the community. And and so, yeah, I love that you talked about that. It's not a one-person decision. It's a it's a group decision in a sense. Absolutely. And and I, what I would say too is, you know, in a, in a position of hiring somebody, I would want to make sure the per person I hire also understands that. Because if not, I'm going to lose them, right? Yeah. Or they're not going to be a great employee because their home life isn't going to be great. Right. And they're going to have trouble at home. So they're going to bring that to work potentially. And their work's going to, you know, maybe um, slack off because of it. Or they're going to burn out in two years and move back home. And so as a potential employer, I want to make sure that you understand that as well. So it's really important that you do have that and that you're all on board. I mean, we see, you see it a lot in sports where you have husband, wife coaches, husband, wife, like a director of ops. Like we see it in, um, we we'll see it in softball a lot, volleyball, okay. um, in college athletics, you see it a lot um, okay. where a husband's, you know, assistant coach and the wife's a head coach or something like that, or their director of ops. Um, but it's because they both, they're on it, right? You got to have the same schedule. They're both okay with it. Um, but the, the two careers thing is really tough. Um, because again, let's say, you know, my wife has a great budding marketing career with a marketing firm here in Raleigh. Um, Awesome. We're here in Chapel Hill. She's in Raleigh. We're making it work. Um, I get a job offer from USC. They call me up and say, hey, we want you to be AD. Okay. <laughs> so I have to go, hey, guess what, Lauren? You have to give up your career, your life yeah. 
all of your friends for me in my career because yeah. this is a better opportunity. That doesn't work, right? That's not going to work. <laughs> um, and so you have to have that conversation on the front end. You have to be okay with it. And you have to be okay with turning down jobs, sure. right? Um, I, I mentioned LSU because that was a recent one for us where okay. my wife was like, we would never live in Baton Rouge. It, it's <laughs> not going to happen for us, right? Like LSU is a great school, all that, but like, we're not going to live in Baton Rouge. That's just not for us. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, no, it, I, the, you know, as a, as, as a sports fan, the opportunity to work there. I mean, they just won women's national championship, baseball yeah. national championship, yeah. Chip Kelly's there, you know, like, Oh, that's a great opportunity, but it's not going to be for my family. So right. you really have to take that into consideration. It is, you know, at least 50%, if not more of the decision, um, the opportunity itself, assess it, whether it's great, but the other half of it is, does it make sense for you in your life? Yeah. Yeah. Great insight there. Uh, bringing it home, final few questions. What is the most heartwarming or memorable sports moment you witnessed or experienced? Maybe something we as the casual fan would never see on TV, but you had the chance to witness or experience. I mean, I got a couple. So I'll, I'll, I'll say this one because this one was – ESPN just did a story about this, about the most memorable firing, the Lane Tarmac firing, um, Kiffin getting fired on the Tarmac. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, but – not that. That was not the most heartwarming. <laughs> heartwarming. Um, but that season, um, Coach O took over the team from there on out. And at the time, he was the um, defensive line coach, and he took over as head coach, interim head coach for the rest of that season. Um, and right at the end of the season, they made a decision to hire Steve Sarkeesian as the head coach. And Ed had applied for that job, and Ed wanted that job. That was He wanted that job. And the players wanted him to have that job. Um, and they gave it to Sark. And when Coach O came in to address the team, that was one of the most emotional things I've ever seen. I mean, it was this hardened, you know, gravelly voiced Cajun breaking down like, you know, a child in front of a team of men uh, right, right now, just talking about it, I'm getting chills because it was just such an impactful, like awe inspiring moment. And it was sad. It was all sad, but to see that much, I guess, humility and humanity to guys that were, you know, walking out that door, the baddest MFers in the world. Right. I mean, they are USC football players. You walk out of, you know, McKay hall and you're, you know, you're a badass, right? You are. Yeah. <laughs> and you walk around like that. And these guys are, they're huge, right? They're huge individuals. They're at SC. They're SC football players. You got Ed yeah. Ogeron, right? He's amazing. He's been a head coach. He's been on TV. You know, he's been in movies, all of that. <laughs> and you got him just crying, right? Yeah. Being emotional, being human beings in a moment that was just, an, it was an amazing moment because that season had taken such a wild turn. And there were so many great moments. And Ed had just turned the team around, the, the the culture of the team around so much in that short window. Um, and because I think Ed wanted it so much and the team wanted him to have it so much, and then it went to Sark, it was just such a powerful moment. It really was. Um, and then I think only second to that was when Clay had to coach them in the Vegas Bowl then because Ed stepped out. He's like, I can't even coach him in the Vegas Bowl. And so Clay had to step in and take it. And those guys basically clinging on to Clay as though he was Ed. Like they, they, you know, because they could have just walked out. I mean, the, the, the emotion in that room, those players were ready just to say, nope, we're not playing. We're done. Yeah. But Clay got in there and Ed got in there and they said, look, let's do this together. You know, let's do it. And so they went and, and played that Vegas Bowl and won it. It, it, that was like one of those things behind the scenes you don't see that that real emotion right like yeah. a lot of times people talk about emotion and sports and all of that but that is just raw emotion that's a man that didn't get the job dream job that he wanted for the team that he had fought so hard for in yeah. the last six weeks um and a bunch of guys who had given up on football essentially found it you know found their inspiration again and their spark again and ed and then just to have it all take, taken away 
at the last second. So that was tough. Um, and that's not to, you know, it's not to talk about the decision, whether it was right or wrong. It was just such an emotional, um, you know, an emotional moment. It was, it was, it was neat. It was neat to be there for that. Yeah, I'm sure it was. It sounds like a, a great opportunity and a great time for sure. Uh, a couple more questions. If you could choose one song to play every time you walked into a room, what would you choose and why? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, um, I thought about it. Uh, you, you know, I, I think probably something by James Brown, something like that. Um, some some smooth confidence, right? I mean, that's that's what I call James Brown, right? Smooth confidence. Like, he didn't have to – you don't have to say anything. He didn't have to be introduced. That man's confident when he walks in the room, right? It's every step he takes. And so, like, you know, maybe the boss, right? James Brown, the boss, something like that. Um, I think that'd be good. All right. All right. Uh, final question. Sports often brings people together and creates unforgettable moments. Can you share a personal sports memory that left a lasting impact on you? Uh, it doesn't have to be an event you worked, maybe one you attended as a fan with your family. Uh, maybe just one that stuck out the most to you. Yeah. Um, so when I was at Michigan, um, we had this uh, player um, and he, so he, was a transfer uh, or kind of a transfer. Um, he had spent four years at Harvard um, and his went there to play football, was mediocre, was okay football player, but went to Harvard, um, could have played probably low division one. Um, in his first year, he got cancer and um, like terrible cancer, tried to survive, was going to school, took some time off, kicked kick cancer graduated Harvard. Awesome. Um, went to wall street, started working for a firm in wall street, decided that he wanted to get his uh, master's degree in business. So he applied to some schools, applied to Michigan, got into Michigan, um, clear and free of cancer for two or three years. Now, um, comes back, um, to Michigan to start his grad program, walks into Jim Harbaugh's office and says, tells him his story and says, lifelong Michigan fan, love football, went to Harvard, it got cancer, finally in remission, all this stuff. I'd love to come and play football for you. This guy's like 25, right? I mean, there's no way. And so, but Jim, being inspired by this guy, I mean, the, and, and, the, and the kid is just like energy times a thousand, like just a light in the room as soon as he walks in. And Jim's just inspired by him and says, you know, what? we got to get this kid on the field. we got to get this kid in the locker room. we got to get him on the field. Do whatever we can to help this guy out. He's an amazing kid. He's got an amazing story. we got to do it. Um, and so Jim calls and he says, hey, I want you to meet this guy and figure out a way to get him on the field, get him eligible. And I said, okay, let's, let's look at him. So um, meet with him. Great kid. You know, amazing individual. Um, we worked through his eligibility. He's been out of college for two and a half years. Um, he graduated from Harvard. Um, he did play football there. So his clock started all of that stuff. Eligibility is probably exhausted. So we said, look, let's, let's go to the NCAA. Um, and let's put all of this medical information there and say, look, he, he had cancer. He had no opportunity to play for four years while this cancer was going on. Significant medical documentation, Lots of lots of back and forth between the NCAA and us, um, and ultimately we got the kid eligible to play one year. Um, so the guy's 25, kicked cancer's ass, coming back for a grad program, um, and gets gets to get on the field for one last time um, in Michigan, the the team that he grew up loving, um, and he they it was like I think it was the I think it was Central Michigan. We were playing Central Michigan at home. We were up by. 30 or 40 points. He played fullback, I think. Um, and they gave him the ball and he got a run in for it. Either it was a two point conversion or a touchdown or something. But I just remember, you know, the crowd was like, Oh, right. And there was like this, like, Oh, cause it was already 45 to seven. And yeah. it wasn't that big of a celebration, but I remember seeing him and how excited and how amazing he thought, right. He just won the super bowl. It was yeah. that to him and just seeing it, knowing that like him, me, Jim, his parents, and maybe a couple other people knew about, how special this actually was. Yeah. Um, and that was neat because we, you know, some of the stuff we do here, especially in compliance and athletics, um, there's a lot of rules. There's a lot of saying no. There's sure. a lot of, you know, don't do this. 
Um, but there are rare opportunities where we're able to do things like this and make a dream happen. Sure. And that's why you do it. I mean, that's, I mean, it gives you, you know, the, the feels, right. I mean, that's what it does. Um, and so being able to do that, even for that individual, that was great. Um, still something I talk about today because it is so neat. Um, but to be able to do that, even for that one individual was a neat thing. And it kind of keeps you going for that next yeah. opportunity to, Hey, just help out that next kid, that next person who wants to make their dream happen. Yeah. Sounds amazing. And I'm sure, uh, it was an amazing opportunity for him and his family for sure. Uh, Nate, thanks so much just for taking yeah. some time to jump on the podcast, starting with your time, Jacksonville state, uh, and now where you're at at North Carolina. Just appreciate you jumping on the podcast and, and sharing some insight. You got it. Happy to be here and, and glad to share. Thank you for watching another episode of the Suits in the Stadium podcast. You can still find the audio version of our podcast wherever you get your podcast, including Spotify, Apple Music, Google Podcast, iHeartRadio, and many more. New this season, you can find the video version of our podcast on our YouTube channel. Please make sure if you haven't already to follow us across social media platforms, including LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. We release new episodes every Monday, so make sure you subscribe so you never miss a single episode. Thanks so much, and we'll see you in the next one.